Hello, this is the State Senate DFL Podcast, Call of the Senate. I'm your host, Senator Jeff Hayden. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today we come to you with solemn hearts and a lot of grief. Uh, I think most of us right now, uh, all around the world, and especially here in Minnesota and the United States, have witnessed the murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, we want to first of all send our sincere condolences uh, to Mr. Floyd and his family and friends. Uh, and we know that the whole city is grieving, and certainly those of us in the Minnesota Senate, especially in the Senate DFL caucus, uh, are grieving with you. Uh, today, I have two of my good friends in the Minneapolis uh, delegation uh, that have been working hard uh, on police and law enforcement reform for many years Senator Scott Dibble and Senator Carrie Deasy. Uh, we just want to start and just kind of get right into it uh, for the sake of time. Um, we know that both of you have been working hard uh, on this issue. First of all, uh, Senator Dibble, can you just tell us how you're feeling and then maybe give us a little sense of how long you've been involved with this issue of uh, law enforcement reform? Thanks, uh, Jeff. And uh, let me echo your words of condolence and uh, great sorrow to the family of George Floyd and really to, uh, to everyone in, in Minneapolis and beyond um, who, who really feels this tragedy. And of course, it's the culmination of um, the kind of just uh, systemic and, and um, individual racism um, that some in our community experience every single day in a whole myriad of ways. And so I'm just absolutely devastated. Um, paradoxically, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, there may oppor be opportunity in this tragedy uh, when I hear from uh, so many of my white constituents who are, um, who, who may be accessing for the first time what black Mini Minneapolitans have been telling us for a long, long time. And of course, what is evident from what we see in, in the racial gaps and disparities that, that we can just see around us in form of housing and, and education and health opportunities, et cetera. Um, uh, I've been um, working on issues of, of racial justice and, and social justice and human rights and civil rights uh, since I was very young. I come to it, of course, as a out gay man, out LGBTQ person. Um, I don't want to presume to have the same experience as, as someone like you, Jeff, um, but I've had a little taste of, of what it means uh, to be marginalized and to be despised by um, you know, the major institutions of our society. I've been the victim of police brutality as my, has been my, my then partner. Um, nothing, like, uh, nothing like it is to walk around and drive around a black man, but it's been my experience. And, and uh, back when I was young, um, because of those experiences, you know, we joined forces as communities with the African American community um, to push for the civilian review authority and, and things like that. Um, since I've been a legislator, I've been uh, trying to institute policy change. Everything comes down to policy and, and institute laws um, that better um, oversee and govern and, and hold accountable and make more transparent uh, policing in our communities. And I presently have a, a number of bills, two of which. Um, include uh, changing how we do the investigation and prosecution to use of deadly force so that we're not relying on other police to investigate police. Um, you know, we know about the phenomenon of the blue wall of silence, the blue shield, and, um, and also relying on county prosecutors who are just an extension of, of policing and carrying out the, the charging of crimes that, that the police are, are involved in, in, in arresting for. Um, you know, creating the kinds of, of confirmation bias and, and motivated reasoning that lead to outcomes that, that aren't serving the interests of justice or don't engender public support and, and confidence. So that's what that bill would achieve. A number of other jurisdictions have independent investigators and prosecutors. We need to do that here in Minnesota, and we've been stopped uh, dead in our tracks by the Republican majority in the Senate. Another bill is more expansive in its sweep and scope, and that would create um, a very robust form of citizen oversight councils that um, have sig a significant role in the hiring and the firing of the leadership of the police and establishing um, the, the, the uh, expectations and the training 
and all the elements that, that police are expected to uphold in carrying out their duties and responsibilities. It creates um, uh, mechanisms for uh, tracking uh, police community interactions, um, you know, and tracked by, by race. And, um, and it just creates a, a whole um, accountability uh, uh, system in which um, there's greater oversight, greater training, greater expectation, greater transparency, um, and, and uh, a lot of the power is invested uh, with a broader array of members of our community. Again, a bill that I've been pursuing for a number of years and has been stopped dead in its tracks by the Senate Republicans, which is unfortunate, but we're going to keep going because- Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to that. Senator Deesig, help us understand some of the work that you're doing, and I know that um, you sit on the Judiciary Committee that looks directly at and has oversight uh, over uh, these issues. Uh, uh, help us understand some of the work you've done and, 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 and any comments that you have about, about the day and, and, and the, the times that we're in. And thank you. Thank you for including me in this uh, podcast. I appreciate that. It has been a, uh, I don't think any of us have slept that much the last few days. It has been uh, terrifying and, and scary and um, heartwarming in the same way because we have seen moments of um, people reaching out. And I think it was the video in itself of watching Mr. Floyd die was so shocking and horrifying that um, I think it was a shock to so many, so many people that I think it woke a lot of people up. And I think that's where it is. I'm trying to find a positive out of a negative. And I think that is, um, I think that it will shock, it shock the system such that I think we can actually shock the system going forward and we can make structural changes that we need to do to dismantle racism. So I'm on the Judiciary Committee and is where I have focused a lot of my time on that committee is um, training. So I think police training is huge. And so really trying to get more training from uh, mental health to help them identify when you have people in crisis to deal with crisis intervention, helping them um, law enforcement, literally when you come across a person who might have a nonverbal disability to so that they can um, recognize that and, and then just the whole cultural competency training. And I am a strong believer in that, but I also think at this point, I don't know if what we're doing is working. So some of what, in talking to some of my colleagues, what I think we need to do is literally do really broad reform. We can't just do a little bit around the edges and offer a little bit of money here so that they can do a little bit more training because clearly it's not working. I think we need to literally need to look at who are we hiring, what are the requirements to be a police officer, and then what are those ongoing requirements and what is the training required. So I think we need to do some really structural changes to really make that make that happen because who do we want as our law enforcement and it needs to be a partnership and a community partnership and it needs to be true community policing and I don't think that's just in Minneapolis I think that's across the state but I do also think we should be looking at residency requirements we had residency requirements in Minneapolis in the past and right now 95 percent of the police officers don't live in Minneapolis so I think that's another part of the package that I think we should look at because I think once you know your neighbors and you live in that community and you're a part of that community, I think it changes the dynamics. So those are some of the things that um, I have been working on and I think we need to really push forward to literally change what we're doing. Um, I think we're putting together a package that is a comprehensive package. It's really a broad piece and it's really forward looking um, to rebuild the public trust because I think the trust is gone. And I don't know how you have I mean, I don't know how law enforcement can be effective if they don't have the trust and the confidence of the public, and I think that's been lost. So I think the packages will hopefully build that trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. And it, we, again, we want to demolish racism and establish a culture of transparency that ensures accountability. So that's so, what I want to Well, thank you, Senator uh, Desek. I, I really think that's good. I mean, Senator Dibble, I, I got a couple of things I might want to add, but, but before that, Senator Dibble, what do you feel about this issue of liability that, you know, uh, when police uh, have this misconduct, for instance, uh, we saw cases where it, uh, Minneapolis, they're legendary. I mean, there's tens of millions of dollars that have been gone, have gone out since all of us have been in the legislature and been involved. Uh, you know, Senator Desix, a former county uh, policy aide, you and I worked for the city. And so, you know, I, I lost track at probably $50 million, especially after the last one. So what about this issue that, 
uh, if we are going to keep the same structure, even if we change it and we, we do some reforms to it, but we're not going to just put it in receivership or totally flip it on his head, which is what I'm thinking we may want to do the more and more we hear about it. What about this issue of police carrying their own liability insurance, much like doctors do? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's definitely um, uh, warrants. Uh, I, I think we should be. Um, uh, uh, I have expressed extreme uh, uh, unhappiness with our municipal leaders about the fact that uh, we work very hard at the legislature uh, to protect and secure crucial resources um, so that um, the kinds of services that are provided at the local level, um, which we provide in many ways uh, across the board uh, on a regional basis and, and to the many tens of thousands of people who visit Minneapolis. Minneapolis, when we pay for, um, you know, just crucial transportation, public works, public safety, uh, parks and recreation type services, we're, 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 we're supporting a whole regional uh, 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 entity. And, um, and so we work very, very hard um, to make sure that the locally generated resources like the property taxes don't have so much pressure. And so we work very hard as legislators um, to get a million here to protect a, 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 an attempt of, of theft of $5 million, you know, and then all of a sudden it all gets wiped out by a $20 million um, uh, right. wrong, um, uh, settlement. Um, and yeah, it's unconscionable. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I just started to think about it. I know the more, uh, that I hear about it, you know, I, I just as was mentioning in some press we did earlier that, you know, I don't mind. I think it's great, fifty-three-year-old black man. Frankly, I probably should get Social Security. But, um, but when I was a little boy, the first, you know, right after I learned how to cross the street, my mother warned me about the Minneapolis Police Department, and that that really kind of hit me. That's you know, almost fifty years ago or forty-eight years ago, whenever I learned how to do that. So like the the idea, and I think the work that we want to do, and I think the work that we need to be able to get to the legislature, especially being in a divided legislature, and I want to say that to people, but I know people are looking for radical change, and we certainly want to give it to them. But in a divided legislature, you know, there probably is some level of compromise. But if I start thinking out into the future and start thinking about what, what does a, a, a community policing model look like, um, and does it just need to be revamped? Does it, does it need to be incorporated in the Hennepin County Sheriff? Uh, should we, uh, you know, just kind of start over again? Because, you know, I'm not sure how the culture changes uh, one way or the other if, you know, if we still have the same mentality uh, that's there. I mean, when we saw uh, the, the, the officer, I don't even want to say his name, but we all saw him and he had his hands in his pocket. He was on his neck for nine minutes with his hands in his pocket looking at community filming him there was something deeply wrong and uh, extremely narcissistic and arrogant about that, that I don't want to castigate all Minneapolis police officers with, but there seems to be a culture here that doesn't really care. And it could be what you said, Senator Dixon, maybe it's because they don't live in the community like they did when we uh, grew up here, or maybe it is much more citizen involvement and much more oversight by citizens. Maybe it is, you know, starting over and everybody starts and they get to, we put a model out there and everybody gets to reapply for their job. And I think that people still want to feel safe in their community. But uh, what has been demonstrated in terms of what it cost us, what happens, um, and frankly, I have to tell you that what happened uh, to Mr. Floyd, um, though everybody else got to see it live in the living color on Facebook, but if you talk to a lot of people, African Americans, people of color, or their friends, they'll tell you that that's really not nothing new. Um, that that kind of behavior uh, has been going on for a long time. It's just been, um, it's just been masked, if you will. So, so I, I, I just kind of want to get you guys' thoughts on that. I know we're going to run out of time here soon on just, it, 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 you know, we're going to go in this legislative session and we're going to demand change and we're not going to take no for an answer. And uh, I think Senator Kazelka saying that he's going to start with the police union is the wrong thing. Uh, Kroll is the wrong guy for the job, clearly. Um, but I do think that, you know, there probably is some things we can do now. But I'd like to just get a sense of you guys as we close. What do you think the future could look like if we had radical change? If we had radical change, um, uh, you know, the police uh, would not be the um, ultimate expression of government power and authority with the sole ability to use force um, and, and have that 
um, you know, be actually a, a force that that contributes to uh, deterioration of public safety and 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 uh, and public order. Um, you know, I think that's the the real. You know, that's why I, I really hope. You know, to the extent that there are uh, cops of goodwill, that they start finding their voice and speaking up because 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 what is happening and 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 the truth of the culture of that of that agency is that it does not add to public safety. It detracts and deteriorates on public safety. Now, of course, you know, the police systems are a, a manifestation and an expression of larger systems of, 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 of white uh, supremacy and, and, and systems that are geared towards upholding um, the power and the, and, the, and the privileges of those who already have so much power and privilege. I mean, why else is there uh, you know, more wealth disparity and, and more, re, more money held by fewer people than since the Gilded Era 100 years ago. I mean, we know what's going on in this country, um, you know, and so there's a larger conversation uh, to be had here. But, um, you know, imagine, uh, someone said on, on, on Facebook uh, yesterday, imagine if, if the police, rather than standing on the top of the third precinct firing bullets and antagonizing the whole situation, or, or if you saw the cops driving by spraying pepper spray randomly out, out of their windows at peaceful protesters downtown yesterday. Imagine if they had come um, in a spirit of, of sorrow and mourning and, and, and healing um, and approached the, the peaceful protesters uh, with an open hand and, and, and actually approached and communicated with them um, to try to breach that great divide. Imagine what that would have been like. Um, that, that could have happened and that did not happen. Well, you know, in Ferguson, I, I was reminded in watching some footage in Ferguson, there was a cop there, he was a captain. And when they were marching, he started to march with them because he believed in what they did. And I, he might have went on to, be, to, to get in the legislature, but it was, it was a turning point there uh, when he decided that this was his community and that what had been perpetrated was wrong and that he was going to march with them. So, uh, so Senator Dibble, I, I agree. Uh, Senator Dibble, what about you? What, what do you think that you know, in, in realistic terms, what, what is real change? Um, you know, you're a lifelong resident of Minneapolis uh, with strong ties to first responders. So I know you care a lot about this issue. What do you think, or what are, what are the, the, the great first responders in your family? What, are, what, are they, what advice are they giving you? What, what really can we do in a real way? Well, I think we do need to, like Senator Dibble said, imagine. And I think that's just imagine what do we want that future to look like. And I think it is community policing. And it, the police are there to protect and serve. And so they are servants. And it's about helping people. And so I think that mentality has been gone. And it is, you know, you can protect people by helping people. And it's, it is, it's more of a social worker model because you are there to help people. And so I think we do need to just flip it, flip it on its head. And I do think we need to, to, it's not working to literally chip away at the pieces of what that culture looks like. So I do think we need to just, I don't want to say throw everything out, but I do think we need to start from scratch and literally look at what do we want this police force and the, our law enforcement across the state to look like. And they need to be and look like the community and they need to be part of the community. And I do think we need to just completely change the way and the, the dynamic and the thought process because it, it needs some more transparency and accountability to rebuild that trust. Well, well, well thank you. You know, I, I, I think the same thing. And I, I guess what I really want to say in closing is one, you know, once again, we want to extend our, our, our condolences to the family, uh, to the community. Um, uh, there has just been a lot of mayhem. There are a lot of people who have been affected by this personally and then also um, you know, uh, in terms of their ability to to shop and their ability to live their lives in a peaceful way. So um, I guess what I also want to say is that, you know, there's going to be a series of proposals and they're going to be led uh, by people of color. Um, they're going to be led uh, by myself and other Senator Champion and other House members. But I want to send a really heartfelt thanks to the both of you and other allies in our caucus uh, and in the House caucus. And hopefully, um, our Republican friends won't get in our way. And thank you for being great allies and allowing us to be able to lead on this issue. I think that that is really, really important. So I, I'm, I'm certainly indebted uh, to you for the work that you've done, but also uh, your ability to, to, to be with us 
uh, as we go through this fight. So um, I guess I'm going to end there. Senator Scott Dibble, Senator Kerry Diesick, thank both of you on this special edition of Call of the Senate. Thanks for listening to Call of the Senate. I'm Senator Jeff Hayden, and I hope you enjoy getting to know my colleagues and hearing about important things that are happening at the Capitol. If you'd like to hear more stories, please visit our website, senatedfl.mn, or connect with us on social media with the handle at SenateDFL. Thank you.